Welcome everyone to our second plenary session. Um, we're just going to wait for a moment or two while people um, enter the room. It, it, there's so many of you, it, it does take a couple of minutes for um, the system to say that you have all arrived. So please bear with us for a moment or two. Yeah, the numbers are steadily climbing. We have over over 70 people already joining. So welcome everyone. We're just waiting a moment or two while people join the room and then shortly we will uh, begin this second plenary. So welcome everyone to our second plenary. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Ellen from, who's currently um, on the west coast of the United States. Um, I'm gonna do a short introduction, the, the housekeeping slide and a short introduction to Ellen before I hand over to her. Ellen, if you wouldn't mind clicking to the next slide, please. So I think if you've been to a session before, you this is now familiar. It's just a, a housekeeping slide um, to help you get the most out of your experience through the Zoom platform. Firstly, we recommend that you put the speaker in the top right hand corner. That way you can see all of the slides. There are, there are two ways of communicating with us. There is the chat function and the Q&A function. Please use the chat function to send messages or comments rather than raising your hand and if you have any questions for Ellen please enter them into the Q&A function that allows everybody to see what questions are being posed and it also allows you the opportunity to vote for your favourite questions and that way after Ellen has finished talking I will go through and manage the questions so that we can make sure that Ellen uh, gets to answer the ones with the, the most votes. And then finally, just to remind you that there will be a video available uh, at the end of the conference. Now I realise I didn't say who I was and for some of you, you may this may be the first session at the conference. Welcome, I'm Francis O'Brien, I'm one of the co-chairs uh, with Jürgen Branker. We're both at the University of Warwick where the conference was due to be face to face. I'd now like to introduce you to Ellen. Ellen, if I could have the next slide please. So Ellen is a global consultant based on the west coast of the United States. She works in the areas of systems thinking, organisational development and evaluation. She's a systems thinker who pays attention to how organisational and social systems attend to gender this economic well-being, cultural contexts and community engagements. She's lived and or worked in many countries, many different continents, Asia, Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, Europe, Latin America, the Caribbean, the UK and the US. As well as covering numerous countries and communities, her work spans a multitude of sectors and organisations. She works with public, private and community organisations to help them thrive in the face of change, complexity and uncertainty and to collaboratively identify ways of measuring change and impact. Her consultancy work is conducted through the ethos of engagement consulting organisation. She has taught at university level both in the US and the UK and is most active in the global development area designing curriculum training and building capacity for public and private sector staff and rural populations. She works through both English and Spanish using inclusive, participatory and culturally responsive curricula. She's also a visiting researcher with the Centre for System Studies at the Faculty of Business Law and Politics at the University of Hull. 
Her work in the area of evaluation is attracting a lot of interest across the whole research community. She has recently developed a new evaluation approach for UN Women that focuses on evaluating developing country projects in terms of gender, environments and marginalised voices. And she is co-author of a UN Women publication, Inclusive Systemic Evaluation. So uh, you are very welcome to uh, joining us at OR62, Ellen, and I will hand over to you for your plenary talk. Thank you, Francis. Um, good afternoon, um, or in my case, good morning. It's five o'clock in the morning here in Northern California. Uh, and the skies are clearer every day as we continue to recover from the terrible fire season along the Western United States. Um, I'd like to thank Gerald Midgley from the Center for System Studies at the University of Hull in the UK and Francis O'Brien and Jurgen Branke, uh, who are the OR62 conference chairs for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm honored uh, and I look forward to, um, um, to this presentation today um, and, um, and I'm looking forward to learning about more about the OR Society members and their guests about the intersections of our work. First, I'd like to give a little brief overview of community OR uh, from my understandings of it. Um, it's important social change efforts, and then I will um, introduce and begin to unfold my work, which is also deeply rooted in systems thinking, community engagement, um, and, uh, and community and engagement. So um, as you can see on the slides in the US, OR practitioners have worked with community groups since the 1960s and in the UK since the mid 70s. There's a uh, combined emphasis on the meaningful engagement of communities, regardless of whether the funder is the public, private or voluntary sector. Um, they're not defined by a fine, uh, finite set of ideas or intervention methodologies or methods, but it's a group of practitioners who wanna learn about community development and engagement practices. Community OR has projects um, at the local, national, and at global level. And um, OR practitioners and system thinkers constitute two interrelated communities of practice who learn from each other while we preserve our unique identities and our differences. So um, inclusive systemic evaluation, which is an emerging evaluation, it's only been in, um, published since 2018. Um, uh, used, is used primarily in global development context, and it's part of the broader critical systems thinking body of work. Um, the work is evolving, working with a group of global collaborators to move the ideas and analysis beyond evaluation and into other parts of uh, project development, management science, and organization development. Um, inclusive systemic evaluation um, and the evolving inclusive systemic thinking is grounded in system thinking. It was designed initially to respond to the complexity of the sustainable development goals. And I'll talk a little bit about that more in a bit. Um, we do prioritize looking through lenses, uh, which we call the GEMS, so gender equality, environments, and marginalized voices, and their intersections in projects and in interventions. We pay attention to power dynamics, um, and we are constantly looking at the boundaries of the project and pivoting to a respond to emergence with constant reflection on our practice um, and incoming information. Um, we seek to work collaboratively and define community with the community about who should be in and what's, what's in and what's out and what should we consider and what not with stakeholders across the systems of focus. Um, we also focus on methodology and methods and grounded in theories of community, gender, organization, and social environmental systems. So as you can see, our intersections between community OR and ISD are many. Um, we, we work with communities and we seek, part we seek participating in an inclusive research network at the local, national, and global levels. We seek meaningful engagement of communities. Um, we build community development practice. Um, our client base is broad and we seek engagement beyond consultation. So let me go over the evaluation guide just a little bit, because that's what this, um, the work is founded on. Um, there's this, so now that we've had a brief overview of community OR and how um, in, uh, IST intersect, I want to go further in describing how um, IST strives to ensure meaningful community engagement, which involves enabling people from local communities to have substantial input into framing both the issues to be discussed and potential actions to address them whether the issues are first raised as a concern by the community itself 
or by a public or private sector organization wanting, uh, wanting that community's involvement. On this slide, you can see the chapters outlined in the Inclusive Systemic Evaluation Guide, um, which I co-authored uh, uh, for you. It's a UN Women publication I co-authored with Ann Stevens and Shavanti Reddy. The fieldwork I have done with global partners has moved this work beyond inclusive systemic evaluation to a broader understanding, an application called inclusive systemic thinking using three key dimensions, which I just mentioned, which are the gems, gender equality, environs, and marginalized voices. And I'll give definitions for those in a little bit. The guide, which can be downloaded for free, is available in English uh, or Spanish from the UN Women Publication website. It's also available on um, the OR Society's resources website, I'm told. Um, this concept of engagement in community as participatory activities are central to our work. Um, and I'll go into those ideas in the rest of this uh, presentation and also uh, share with you a case study from a recent project in Colombia. So as you can see, the guide is written in two sections, part A, which is the practitioner theory, which is the part that we'll cover today. And part B, um, for those of you that are involved with evaluation, it takes the practitioner part um, and uh, applies it to an evaluation methodology. Um, so it's actually step-by-step -step suggestions, not um, a, guide, a guide. It's only there to guide you and to help inform your work. So the work um, that we uh, uh, have done is based, we stand on the heads of many giants who influenced our work that come from system sciences, the social sciences, evaluation, and environmental fields. Um, the guide is also peer reviewed by 30 global uh, researchers, academics, um, systems thinkers, um, evaluation experts, um, and we received a lot of feedback and made adapt adaptations accordingly. So why did we do this? Why, why do this guide? Um, it really was in response to the sustainable development goals. Um, during the 2000 to 2015, the Millennium Goals, if you remember those, there was eight of them. Um, and many lessons were gained from that, those 15 years that informed the creation of our current goals. Um, we realized that there's a need for strong monitoring evaluation framework uh, to provide better evidence for learning, decision-making, and accountability. They were written um, with, a prim with a colonial lens, let's say, meaning that only countries considered still uh, emerging um, or in the global south needed to be demonstrate progress. And as we know, progress overall does not mean progress for all. So the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, differ from the MDGs in, five, in many ways. Um, and they're still a bit controversial. Not everybody has, um, feels comfortable with their approach, but they are, uh, they have been uh, signed off by 189 countries, and it was a participatory process to ensure that the ownership of these countries. Those are universal, they're universal for developed and developing countries. They're integral and integrated to consider human and sustainable development, so the people and the planet. Um, and and they, it's focused on the elimination of income poverty, of, of ensuring peace for all and partnerships and realizing that no one can do it alone. We all need to be working on these uh, ideas um, so, so that no one is left behind, focusing on those that are the most excluded. However, some of the um, things that, that Sustainable Development Goals did not, has not focused on are things like some of the marginalized uh, voices, like there's no mention, for example, of the LGBTQI identities. Um, they do encourage and uh, robust country-led evaluation. So there's a focus on capacity development. Um, and it's amazing feel for those interested in contributing to uh, change using qualitative and quantitative methodologies, as well as those interested in complexity and system thinking sciences. Um, the SDGs bring together human rights, social justice, and gender equality to the forefront. Um, for the evaluation community, it's an opportunity and challenge, uh, I think, for all for all of us, excuse me, because of their complexity. Um, it brings together evaluation and ev evidence base to inform policy making. So the UN goals are also a major achievement for the development of shared goals for all humanity. Um, on the top left diagram, you can see the, the 17 sustainable development goals that I just referred to that are guiding global development from 2015 to 2030. The larger diagram shows that these same 17 goals and their interrelationships between the goals of components of sustainability 
and the overarching goal of sustainable development. You can see that the SDGs linkages across categories and between one another. This diagram, which comes from an article by Constanza et al, um, suggests that we need an aggregate indicator as well as the individual ones that can assess the relative contribution of each SDG and their interactions with each other in order to assess the overall progress. Um, for those of you involved with systems dynamics, um, the article also proposes the development of an underlying systems dynamics model to assess the interactions and synergies over space and time, including both stocks and flows, causes and effects. The challenge as global practitioners um, is to consider how to assess these goals, uh, the global programs. They have these of uh, this different intersections. How do we measure that um, over time? Resolving these challenges will require transdisciplinary problem solving, innovation, and we believe systems thinking. Take, for example, an intervention on increasing graduation rate of high school girls who are of menstruation age in an emerging economy. But grad, uh, by graduation rates, which would fall under SDG 4, which is quality education, cannot be fully understood without an analysis of the school's accesses to adequate water, sanitation, and hygiene or SDG 6. Um, studies show that school absenteeism for high school girls is correlated to their access to uh, clean water and sanitation. An evaluation in 2019 by UNICEF found that in schools in low income countries, only 51% of the schools had access to adequate water sources and only 45% had adequate sanitation. So this is a, just a brief list, I don't expect you to read through it, um, that of multilateral agencies that have explicitly encouraged using the systems approach to help grapple with the complexity of the sustainable development goals. And you'll be able to uh, access these resources um, from the PowerPoint. So let me give you an example of wh what that complexity might look like in a project. Um, this is an evaluation project that I conducted last year with uh, colleagues from Australia. Um, it was a gender responsive alternatives to climate change. It was done in three di very different countries, different cultures, Cambodia, Kenya, and Vanuatu. It focused on disaster preparedness and building capacity of, of rural women and government official women um, in disaster preparedness. It was a women's leadership and in community empowerment, and they received training um, and, a and an opportunity to practice uh, in gender, human rights, political advocacy, and learning about their own budget cycles so they can see where and when they can uh, attend um, to influence the budget cycles so that they can receive resources um, for their communities. And they also were taught advocating in public uh, speaking uh, in front of government and public forums. The, the project was trying to make an impact at local, regional, national, and global level and at the policy and doing policy change. So thinking through complex contexts, um, that's one of the things that with any uh, development project, now we say probably almost any project, there's this, a level of complexity. Um, in this diagram, you can see that there's many ways to get over um, the wall. We think of, when we think about community engagement, we stop to consider the key elements of complexity. We talk about uncertainty, which is affected by events beyond the intervention's control. It increases the difficulty to, and, um, of remaining flexible. Um, our approach suggests flexibility is a guiding design principle to respond to the unpredictability of any project. Assume that uncertainty will occur and that your, our presence as an evaluator and as a, a consultant will add to that complexity. We also look at the emergence, taking um, as a starting point that the intervention, regardless of its nature, is not simple context, but a complex one. Identifying and being responsive to the emergence is essential to understanding the complexity by ensuring that actual consequences or outcomes are identified and not just focus on what the intended outcomes were from the original project design um, and predetermined goals. Uh, we must also consider how these goals are altered, right? Either implicitly or explicitly, explicitly by emergent outcomes. It means looking beyond the logic model for intervention with an open mind to assess what are the real effects, whether positive or negative. Another key component to look, think about is feedback, which describes information returning into a system um, and out of a, from a system. So the feedback loops represent elements of a system that feed or 
feed or provide information, they can either be reinforcing positive or um, balancing negative loops. Um, feedback loops are also one way to understand their interrelatedness of systems and how one might uh, system influence another. Feedback, however, is not a, a, a simple cause and effect uh, relationship. So I've been talking about a system. I, I know that we probably all know what a system is and we all have our definitions of it. Um, so what is a system? This diagram represents the structure of the UN Women, a global organization as, um, as sets of nested systems um, and they could be nested and sit within other systems. They also overlap or entangle with um, other UN uh, systems or other uh, international development systems. As you can see in the small uh, circle, regional and country level offices are much closer to their programmatic work, yet the learning and the knowledge feeds back up, hopefully, um, through the systems. Information flows dynamically upwards and downwards uh, between the nested systems. Thus, a smaller intervention and its impacts in a single village, for example, at a country office level um, could potentially influence the global goals and the objectives of the larger UN system. So now that we've defined systems, let's define um, systems thinking. Um, for the purposes of our work, systems thinking, which is a form of analysis, challenges traditional linear logic and is required when dealing with the complex social situations and multifaceted interventions. Using a systems approach does not separate the individual parts of what is being studied to gain the understanding. What we suggest here is that there's your skills that are needed uh, to understand an intervention. We need to uh, rethink boundaries, uh, which I've already spoken about. We need to think about the systems that are involved and the relationships and their interrelationships, uh, the different perspectives and the systemic nature of these components as a form of analysis using critical thinking to see seeing things as systems. So another key distinction that we pay attention to is the idea of systematic or systemic. Uh, um, Often these terms are often confused and used interchangeably, yet they're very different. Um, if you look at the drawing, the fire respondent, I love this drawing, by the way, <laughs> use it a lot. Uh, if you look at the drawing, the fire respondents have taken a systematic approach to their rescue um, of the woman. They demonstrate the limitation of only using a systematic approach. Uh, when what was really required was the use of a systemat systemic approach, um, because using a net to capture a woman um, when there's a second burning fire, it would require a more holistic analysis of the overall situation. So when working or defining uh, engagement in community, we create what we call a boundary story, uh, which includes both a systematic analysis and a systemic analysis. So what we've just said, this, uh, these charts are from um, um, Eisen's work, uh, Ray Eisen's work, and you can also find it in our guide in his publication. Um, so we call systematic thinking a first order uh, thinking, uh, a way of analysis, which breaks down um, a system into components or dimensions to determine its purpose, its functions, key actors, location. We're asking ourselves, what is in the system? What does it do? Where is the system? Who's in it? These first order questions are often very static and don't assume the system is in movement, uh, dynamic or shifting. These systems are also just there, or they're givens, right? Um, systematic thinking may not, may not move beyond this level of analysis. This is typically done, the way we, how we typically use this is that we uh, begin by reading existing documents of the project, reports, websites, uh, staff interviews to get an initial idea of what the project's about. And then we, we transition into the second order judgment, systemic thinking. Now these are not mutually exclusive. We actually can do them simultaneously or they can inform each other. Um, and and so the second order judgments, systemic thinking is a critical and a more uh, holistic analysis of the opportunities, constraints and relationships um, of parts within a system. Analyzing the system as a whole, a holistic view but really understanding that we can never see the whole system. As humans, we're limited by our ability to do that. Um, this analysis goes beyond what has happened, what has happened to what is happening since the launch of the intervention or what is happening now. So the next set of slides further explores a core concept of community OR and inclusive systemic thinking, and that is that of engagement. And we use three primary lenses, gender equality, 
environments, and marginalized voices. So the first lens that we use of the GEMS is, called, is gender equality, and that's number five of the Sustainable Development Goals. Many cultures view gender as a binary concept with two rigidly fixed options, male or female, both grounded in a person's physical anatomy. But this binary biology concept fails to capture the rich variation uh, that exists along a continuum that includes intersex and transgender possibilities. Gendered attributes, opportunities, and relationships are socially constructed, learned, and changeable through socialization processes and are mostly context specific. In our work, gender equality is defined broadly here to, to refer um, to women, to men, transgender, intersex, so the LGBTQ uh, definitions of uh, gender. However, this broad definition cannot always be used um, in all countries. And while conducting a second order analysis, we are cautious um, and thoughtful uh, about how to conduct a, a stakeholder analysis as well as a vulnerability assessment, which I'll talk a little bit more in a bit, um, to make sure that we are not we are causing no harm and putting anybody at risk by defining gender so broadly. So gender is one of those things that um, we think that we all understand, but is unclear for many. Um, as I already described, gender isn't binary. It's not only it's not only male and female. It's not either or necessarily. And in many cases, it's both and. Um, the goal of gender equality is that all human beings are free to develop their personal abilities and to make choices without the limitations set by stereotypes, rigid gender roles, or prejudices. This diagram illustrates how gender identities can exist on continuums. So the next uh, element that that we use di uh, dimension that we use is environments and uh environments with an s i don't know if you, you saw that um which captures both the human made and the natural social ecological landscapes and systems so what that means it includes human made um, and built environments such as towns and cities and refugee camps recreational parks gardens workplaces um, and it also includes natural ecological systems, so forests and mangroves, uh, marine systems, um, and social ecological landscapes of great significance and importance, positive or negative, to human and livestock uh, well-being. So farms or mines or oils, fields, dams. Um, ISC for GEMS also includes the, the concept of habitability and inhabitability of natural and fabricated landscapes. We look at, does the intervention to leave a place more or less habitable? Has the degradation change, has degradation changed the quality of life and for whom? Um, and the consideration of flora and fauna. Our goal is to give voice to the environment, to give them a, a seat at the table um, as an equal participant in um, a balanced and healthy life for everyone. But it also represents a cultural context, such as post uh, environments can, uh, can, can include um, the idea of a post-conflict context or workplace spaces, spaces, such as an operating room, perhaps. So the last dimension that we use um, in our work is the M, or the marginalized voices. And we give, we give that a also a broad definition, which includes human and non-human voices. So initially, it talks about groups of people and their attributes, which may have been pushed to the margins of society and assigned lesser important and discriminated against or excluded. And we don't do this analysis through our lenses alone. We do this, we do this collaboratively with our stakeholders who have much more understanding of what is marginalized in their own societies. So an example of marginalized groups could be the traditional ones, which are elders, the youth, LGBTQ um, identities, ethnic and cultural and religious groups, uh, people that are disabled, indigenous people, um, people with living with HIV. So there's a broad, broad definition. Um, the environment and its living systems are marginalized when we refer to non-human voices such as flora and fauna, cultural language ideas, and we suggest ways that may be considered included in a more uh, concerted effort that many social evaluations are expected to do. So for an example, uh, let's talk about an irrigation project with the Pokot people in Kenya. 
Bringing water to the village would increase food security as well as lower gender-based violence perpetrated on women and girls who have to travel long distances daily in search of water. With the GEMS lens, we, could, we would ask or could ask, who can represent the river, the water source for future generations? It could be a biologist that happens to be part of the team or part of another organization, or it also could be a village elder who knows the river and has known the river for, for years. Another concept that is important to our work is the idea of intersectionality. Um, and it's important for our concept of engagement. Um, this considers the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, uh, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group, uh, regarded as created as overlapping and interdependent systems of dis uh, discrimination or dis disadvantage. Um, if you were interested in intersectionality, the, the, for, the very first work of it was done by Crenshaw, Kim Crenshaw. These elements that define us change every day, and they also change depending on our context. Um, I think of it as living as these as living bubbles or perspectives, depending on where I'm at. So for example, if I'm at my spiritual center, then my religion would be a larger bubble and might have more influence on my ideas that I present. Uh, than if I was at my university, um, where my academic mind might be more present, perhaps. Um, there's an assumption found in some of the accounts of intersectionality that all of these social categories are equally salient all the time. And we don't know that for our own individual truth, that that's not necessarily true. So as a practitioner and as an evaluator, we keep those in mind that those change depending on the context. Um, and it's, intersectionality is very important to the ISC for GEMS approach. Um, as it is the mecha mechanism through which we can make the GEMS dimensions of central concern. In our work, these intersections uh, encourage us to be more inclusive and responsive to different perspectives based on different lived experiences, socialization, context, and realities. In the diagram on the top left, you can see um, where we have the three gems. So those are the three ovals, uh, environments, gender equality, and marginalized voices. And overlaying that is the intersectionality, are, are these circles, these colored circles on top of it, um, which are the social categories with the permeable boundary of all of those represented by this dotted triangle. So another key component of um, our consideration in our work is the idea of engagement and social justice. Um, we look at um, these diagrams show the, the concept between inequality, which the two people couldn't have equal access to the fruit, equality where um, now both people have the same uh, tools and assistance and resources, but is it really equal? and equity, where we adjust the tools and identity and, uh, to address the inequality, the latter is taller in the equity um, diagram, and then justice, how do we fix the system to offer equal access to both tools and the opportunity. Our commitment to engagement is an effort to increase social justice and equality for all. So that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, this uh, work is usually done over a two to three day workshop. Um, so a quick review, um, inclusive systemic thinking is explicit about co-defining um, engagement community, engagement and capacity development processes of the intervention. It's essential for complex and multifaceted interventions. It does a holistic analysis uh, by not separating the individual parts from what is being studied in order to understand it. And it provides a broader understanding of intersecting elements and other, uh, others different and offers different conclusions. So here's a little um, GEMS analysis. Um, if you look at this diagram, what are, we, what are the parts of the system that you can see? So you might say, oh, well, there's the group of men who are sitting at this table studying the discussion about water for the village. And then there's a group of women who are going back and forth and gathering the water. And there's a child that's part of that system um, and its own independent system with, it, with its own needs and priorities. Um, what are the part systems that we need to consider? So if we were to study the water issue for this village, we would want to do a more holistic uh, analysis, which would looking at them separately, but also considering how they operate as a, a systemic whole. We also want to do the, um, the environmental piece. We'd want to think about how the flora and the fauna being impacted 
by the access for the water or the lack of access of the water and the, the water itself. Where is the water coming from? Um, what quality is the water? We need to think about the water as its own stakeholder. But also for the, uh, for the M, marginalized uh, voices, we also want to think what are the voices that are being marginalized in this discussion about water for the village? Um, here you can see it's, it's the women, the water could be the marginalized group, or the child could be a marginalized group. Or the men could be a marginalized group too, depending on the situation. So um, now we're transitioning from um, engagement to talk about what is, um, how do we look at community? What are the things that we can do to, to engage with the community? Which is also a central focus for community OR. So we act as thought partners. Um, using this approach, um, whenever possible and appropriate, is, why, uh, is a way to increase the validity of our work and to go beyond a participatory approach and build community across stakeholder groups and better understand the context. We, are, we need to be self-aware and reflective and able to acknowledge our own perspective and our biases. We, we prioritize looking and increasing gender, human rights, and cultural competencies, and remain flexible and adaptable. And we are really focused on working with co-facilitation, co-evaluation, and co-production of knowledge. Um, authentic collaboration requires a certain these certain attributes and competency, and it demands us to be self-critical and appraisal of our assumptions, our framings, our categories, and our mindsets. Um, which is not easy to do uh, sometimes. And we encourage ISC for GEMS practitioners to integrate systems thinking skills into their evaluation practices. For example, recently in the, in the project I did in Colombia, I hired two um, local so social scientists who are master's students in public policy uh, to be co-evaluators me, with me the whole, the, whole ex the whole way, the whole uh, project. They were much more versed uh, from their lived experience of living in a country which had a 50 years history of conflict and was now focused on building peace. And their contributions were invaluable. So our understanding of community is also informed by what we call um, systemic theory of change, which is an evolving idea and we're still really working on the nuances of it. But it's, it's something that we find very challenging and um, we would welcome support and really thinking this, continuing to develop this concept. Our understanding of community is also informed by systemic theory of change on any intervention, or in other words, a hypothesis of how social change will happen based on past learning and understanding of these change processes. What we know or think we know, it's only a partial view of what is actually happening. As a hypothesis, it needs to be tested and it stays dynamic and it needs to allow for inclusion of new learning that can mean a revision of the original hypothesis or theory of change. Our partial view may be expanded and it's a good to acknowledge that. What we call the stock systemic theory of change is an alternative to the more traditional linear theory of change and it allows for a lot more complexity. The stock acknowledges the complexity of the change processes in a way that sometimes a traditional theory of change may not, and some do, so uh, not all of them are uh, all linear. It is um, developed more from a systematic lens of traditional theory of change, um, looking from the program perspective out, as opposed to a systemic, which is a more holistic perspective. Um, you acknowledge you have only a partial view and um, you want to allow for that expansion. Um, and then there's some key ideas of how we develop it. We look at the uncertainty in the theory by including multiple uh, possible predictions. We allow for the feedback received from attitudes, opinions, assumptions, resistance to uh, the actions being taken. We look for emergence that can include unintended negative and positive outcomes. Um, and we look for the interactions of the gems um, throughout uh, and considered throughout while trying to reduce the complexity of those interactions. The stock is ultimately meant to broaden our understanding of the social change processes we we hope to support um, and the complexity around actually supporting them to make them happen. Um, it also can better reflect the changes that have actually happened and how these changes were valued within a specific context. So when helping to define community, we allow for multiple systemic theories of change um, through developing local boundary stories 
or narratives um, as a method to define the intervention boundary and come to terms with the complexity in retrospect with the integration of the GEMS framework. This, this step provides um, a couple of tools, and I'll talk about the tools uh, in the guide in a little bit. Um, and we do a first order boundary analysis and a stakeholder analysis, as well as a vulnerability assessment of the intervention. For us, the boundary stories includes a consideration of all three of the GEMS dimensions by indicating if they're present and to what extent, if they're not present and why, um, as well as any information collected, connect, collected on how they're seen to intersect within the system. Because the boundary story is done from a systematic or first order perspective, um, we strongly recommend that development is participatory and inclusive process with community stakeholders. The way the boundary story is defined and by whom can have profound effects on what is or what is not considered in activities, for funding, for voices, the limits, um, what, what, what learning needs to occur or has occurred. Simplification of a boundary story can contribute to a narrow or misleading understanding of potential impact and outputs. By using a reflective and participatory collaborative process, we can construct the interventions boundary as a system of people who hold perspectives and actions who generate content within these contexts. Keeping in mind that the intervention may have changed intentionally or unintentionally during the implementation for a number of reasons. It could be changes in context, staff turnover, um, breakout of more uh, disturbance and war conflicts, um, these multiple realities expand uh, what might be an initial narrower understanding of the community you are partnering with and allow for the inclusion of multiple other uh, perspectives. So let me give an example of this. Um, this building the systemic theory of change was a project I'd helped design and implement in Northern California. To better understand why there was a 70% high school graduation rate of incoming class of 500 students, ninth graders, meaning only 350 were graduating after four years. We conducted a community-wide research project asking the question, what does it mean to be ready by 21 years of age for college, work, and life? Over a nine-month period, we interviewed 1,500 uh, youth, teachers, administrators, parents, healthcare providers, um, large and small business representatives, government, the police, um, sports, um, nurses, emergency room nurses, faith-based organizations. Um, we interviewed both mainstream and alternative views to ask what social, academic, and practical assets young people needed to succeed. Collectively, um, these community members used this data to improve the odds for children and youth through the collective impact initiatives, policy alignment, and program quality improvement. Last year, each high school, and I love this, I just looked it up um, for this presentation. Last year, each high school in this city had um, a 96% and a 90% respectively graduation rate compared to the statewide average of 84%. So while building a local um, boundary storage, we also are vigilant about doing no harm. Uh, we look for the gatekeepers as well as those who hold the power informal or uh, formal informal power. Additionally, as practitioners, we embrace the value of doing no harm, either socially, physically, psychologically, economically. Um, of course, this is not always um, possible, but we do want to be very vigilant about it. We ask ourselves questions, how, for example, how is our involvement, our knowledge or expertise perceived by others? Um, how is knowledge shared if knowledge is viewed as an imposition? Um, and where do we stand on, on how objective we are? Are we being objective? Um, we also are very thoughtful about what other ways of knowing are there? Are there other ways of learning in a community, in a culture, um, through experiential work or practical work or in symbolic ways? Um, in ISC for GEM encourages ongoing reflection and critical questioning of our own involvement in biases, as well as being open to knowledge that is present in other uh, ways. So now I'm just gonna quickly call, um, go over some of this. The IC for GEMS guide has many tools. The next few slides are um, examples of these tools that you can find. They're available in PDF or in Word so you can adapt them for your own uh, purposes. One of these tools is a stakeholder analysis which has a three uh, pages of questions that are meant to guide, they're not meant to limit your thinking. They ask you to list different stakeholders. What was each 
individual group or role, uh, group's role, um, what categories beyond male and female included, and identified uh, stakeholders that might be classified as marginalized or vulnerable. Another tool is something that we call the second order, uh, second order boundary analysis that could have been used uh, to build community after you have an initial sense of the po potential stakeholders involved. We ask ourselves, what's missing? What did we miss um, in our initial analysis? Um, are there things that we need to consider on the gems? And within each gems, there's a series of questions to help you think about that. Who are the, who or what are the agencies could be or should be considered as part of the community? What types of networks are formed among these systems? Questions like that. So there's different questions that one, no one can consider for each of the gems. And then the vulnerability assessment. This is something that we also consider and use uh, to make sure that we are causing no harm and there's anything that we need to ask. And we use this with, again, with our uh, local partners and local voices. Um, this is understanding can be jointly defined um, and should be jointly defined. Um, thus, it can be used for designing risk reduction and resilience building measures. Um, it's a platform that promotes interaction among otherwise disconnected members of the community. Um, and the, the tool helps you consider the potential vulnerability levels of the system they represent and propose mitigations that can be essential to supporting the larger community work. An example of this um, is, is supposing that that Miller elder, elder that we spoke about earlier, representing the river where an irrigation project is being established to draw water into the community as a means of increasing food security. If the elder opposes the water, uh, the, uh, the, the, if the elder opposes the river's diversion for fear of the impact of the water availability for future generations, are we putting this elder in harm's way by voicing the opposition to a project supported by the broader community? So let me quickly go over a case study to give an example of how we've done this work. Um, we did a 2019, we did a Colombian evaluation project, which was funded by a European evaluation agency uh, as part of a larger strategic project. It was in a post-conflict setting um, that looked and had issues around security distances to municipalities. The project was a two-year economic development project and had gender components. Um, and um, the GEMS represented were women, uh, there was women indicators about achievement for women, agriculture businesses, indigenous, rural, victims of the war, and internally based, um, displaced people. Uh, the team was comprised of an international consultant and two Colombian team members who are young emerging evaluators. We created our first order analysis, which we did a stakeholder vulnerability assessment. Um, we did analysis of the project do uh, documents and we did initial interviews uh, of the people that were uh, helped implement the project and design the project. We also did desktop work uh, to understand the boundaries. How was, how was it planned? Who, who implemented it? What was the largest target population? What was the political context by setting the boundaries? And then we also looked and mapped the model uh, of the systems. All this information allowed us to understand the boundaries of the project, how, how all the planning process, what changes were made from an original proposal, who implemented it in the field, who was the target population, and so on. This kind of analysis allowed us to model and map all the systems as much as possible. For the design of the evaluation, um, we had to take the complexity and set it, set it in a way that made sense, that could give us a proper path to evaluate the project. Um, we had the post-conflict context boundary, which gave us the evaluation limits, the project outcomes, which is an economic development that reaches even farther than the immediate post-conflict context where the project is working. Because some of the entrepreneurs are selling their products outside of the conflict area, there was also that complexity of the economic development. So we are looking for the gems within these boundaries and their intersections, but we're also looking at three DAC, um, the OECD DAC, what's called the DAC criteria, DAC, um, which is relevance, efficiency, and coherence. So what we did is that we embedded the gems into each of the, these three criteria, into relevance, efficiency, and coherence, by creating, by creating evaluation questions for each of the gems within those DAC criteria. Then the relevance of these had questions about gender equality, environments, and marginalized voices. And that was the overall parameter um, boundary of the overall project. So in the data, um, 
collection phase, one of, one of the contributions I see for GEMS methodology is the emphasis, emphasis on the inclusion of different perspectives. As shown here graphically, we also looked at all the different legal and regulatory instruments that exist in Colombia to recognize the existence of the internal armed conflict and the impact of the victims over these decades. These laws and recognize the, the displacement of people, but we also looked at it at the macro level, which is the coherence, at the meso level, which is the relevance and the effectiveness, which is the micro level. The factors, uh, we also looked at different weather, the budget, the safety um, and travel in these post-conflict areas and limitations. We had, a we had two data cycles, a data collection cycles, one that when we reached data sat uh, saturation, we also looked beyond the gem for the GEMS dimensions and did a systemic triangulation with a participatory process. Um, the systemic analysis, analysis allowed us to help to see that beyond the objectives of the intervention itself. So one of the contributions is that we realized that we couldn't just look at it from a post-conflict uh, um, emphasis but we had to look at it from a more broader peace building, which is the second order analysis. Um, this allowed for a different um, analysis, this broader concept of building peace, represented not only impact of 50 year conflict in Colombia between the armed actors, but also the result of a series of structural social inequalities and inequities um, that helped us understand the context. So if you can see on this first diagram is our first order analysis, which was the, uh, the three gems and the economic uh, project. During our second order analysis, we had that initial uh, analysis, but then we also considered the social political subsystem and the environmental subsystem. So moving forward um, uh, for our collective work, let's, I really want us to think together um, and I'm really, we're open and my colleagues and I, um, community OR and inclusive systemic thinking are both committed to social justice. So uh, we believe there's a scope of learning uh, between the two fields of practice. My questions are for us is, are there ways that the GEMS dimensions can contribute to OR more broadly? Is there space to incorporate the GEMS into your work and life that could contribute to a world that works for everyone? And we welcome uh, being your thought partners. So please do reach out to us. Thank you very much for, for letting me present this information. And now we're gonna have questions and answers. On behalf of everyone, we've over a hundred uh, participants in the room, Ellen. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'll move now to um, the questions and we have um, a clear, clear couple of favorites uh, questions. So the first one, what are the challenges in implementing systemic thinking on such a large scale? Yes, there have been challenges and we're learning from each one, to be honest. Um, the challenges is that we, we, because of the systemic analysis, we uncovered um, things that um, created discomfort with our clients. Um, it, 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 it exposed or, or highlighted information that they were not necessarily comfort, com, uh, comfortable in addressing, um, such as the, the marginalization of indigenous people who are already marginalized for several reasons. Um, and so that's part of the, the learning that we have is that this is a political process as well as an intervention. So we have to be very thoughtful and transparent and respectful as we present this kind of information. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Anthony Hines. He says, thank you, Ellen, for a very thought-provoking talk. I would like to know, how are you able to ensure participation and engagement from relevant stakeholders in the process of applying your systems thinking approach? So what we do is we, we do a lot of um, early research about who are the stakeholders, who are the intended stakeholders, because usually when I, we get a consulting project or we enter an intervention, there's a predetermined identified stakeholder. And through the process of systemic analysis and the tools that we've created for this guide, we can ask deeper questions about who else needs to be included, who else has been impacted, um, who, who, who's impacted but not, um, not active in the process. 
So we use um, different systems thinking methodologies, critical systems heuristics to help us think about and help us work with the community to identify what other stakeholders need to be considered. Thanks very much. Next question from Ruth Kaufman. Who leads these evaluations and how resource hungry is it at local, national and NGO level? So um, to date, um, they've been funded by, um, one was funded, the one that uh, the gender responsive alternatives to climate change um, was funded by a large international NGO um, that ran the project in three different countries. Other projects have been funded by governments. Um, the German government um, funded one. Um, and then we also did some pro bono work in Guatemala um, with a local NGO. Um, so it comes from different sources. And this, this approach is not a salt, it doesn't have to be 100% used as a, sol uh, a, a complete approach. We suggest that there's ideas that can be taken from the ISC for GEMS that can be woven into other traditional or other types of interventions or evaluations. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from Bob Scott. How do you incorporate a political regime in your approach, which appears to be the antithesis of all that the development goals and the electorate seek to achieve? Hashtag asking for a yeah. friend. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is tougher. Um, we did work with government um, both in the project around um, gender responsive alternative to climate change because they were actually part of the stakeholder group. Um, that was part of the, um, the design of the intervention was that they had recruited local rural women to build their capacity around uh, climate change and disaster response, but they also had partnered them with local government women. So they involved the government, the, the intervention itself involved the government components. Um, the work that we did in Colombia most recently, um, government partners were, uh, represented at the local level. So we're talking about um, the, the Office for um, Economic Development in this local region, uh, the Office for Women and uh, Women and, and Women's Empowerment. So we worked with the local, local level. Um, we have not yet worked in a context where it has been, um, the government has been antithetical to the work. Thanks which is much. a learning process. That would be an interesting work to consider. Um, next one from Juanita Bernal Alvarado. From your experience, which SDGs need more work? From your point of view, will humanity reach any of the 2030 goals or are we far away from them? Oh, that's such a great question, Juanita. Um, how, you know, are we going to reach it by 2030? Uh, uh, unlikely. But what's different about these goals, even though they, you know, they have their challenges um, and they have a very um, development focused, uh, economic development focused lens, um, we are making progress. I see progress. Um, I've been doing development work for over 10 years now, and I work primarily in very rural, very poor populations. And I absolutely um, see progress. One, one indicator of that is the work that I did um, in Kenya was that all of the staff of the NGO, which is a large international NGO, it, uh, INGO, um, were local Kenyan people. Um, and so it wasn't staffed heavily with foreigners, which I thought was really a great progress. Um, so that's one example. Thanks very much. I'm just checking on time. Uh, I think we've maybe time for uh, one or two more questions. So the next question is from Ian Newsom. Do you employ large group processes to facilitate this form of systems thinking? And if so, how effective have these been? Yeah, we haven't used the large group. I mean, um, large group interventions as of yet. Um, the largest group, let's say, I've worked with has been 20 to 30. Um, so I think it would be, I still think that, that even a larger group intervention we could talk hundreds, could still utilize these GEMS dimensions to help them think a little bit deeper into what, is the, what are the stakeholders, who needs to be involved, 
and what are the best approaches to make sure that those voices, human and non-human, are represented. Thanks very much. In, in view of time, I'm going to make this next one the last question, Ellen. Um, right. And the other questions we can email to you so that you can see them. And if you have some time, um, you, maybe you could answer those and we could post your, your answers back to the people that have asked them. Lovely. So, so the last question is from uh, Kivan Hosseini. Thank you, Ellen, for the presentation about gender and LGBT. How about disability? Can you include it in your, in, can your approach include it? Absolutely. Disability is also um, a lens we look for. Um, and disability as defined by the local population as well. Um, we found, for example, in Guatemala that the group of women um, that we worked with had marginalized uh, the women that were disabled within their own culture. So that was also true in Kenya. So it took us asking those questions about how, um, how do we include women with disabilities um, in a culture that marginalizes them, as most cultures do, um, in a way that they weren't even present at the meetings. So we were able to ask that question and, and see if we could hold the meeting in a different location. So we're, we're cognizant of that, of those um, dynamics as well. Ellen, it's been a great pleasure to listen to you this afternoon for us, but um, extra special thanks because I know that it is the crack of dawn where you are and probably still dark outside. And we, it really is still are, dark. <laughs> we are really yeah. grateful um, that, that, you have, that you have agreed and, and came and spoke to us today. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. And please do reach out. We mean that earnestly. We would love to hear from you um, and work collaboratively. And if I can stay awake, I, I'm going to try and make the networking um, session in a, in a couple, in an hour or so. That would be great. Hope to see you then. And we Thank you so the, much, everyone. We'll get a copy of the chat to you and a copy of the, the questions. Lovely. Thank you very much, Francis, for your help. And You're Eve, welcome. for yours as well. Thank you for um, those of you um, who were tuning in. I hope um, you found, you've really enjoyed that session as much as I did and look forward to the rest of the, the day's events. We have a parallel session starting in approximately uh, 10 to 15 minutes and then we will be ending the day with a networking session at 3.15 UK time. Hope you can, hope you can join us then.